episode 279 of the Elevation Recovery Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Matt Finch, and I'm going to be your host today. If you've been listening for a while, welcome back. If you're new, welcome. Let's get right into it. Today, I'm going to be discussing a section from the absolute, my absolute favorite book that I ever read for addiction recovery. It came out about a year before I recovered from addiction. The title of the book is End Your Addiction Now, the proven nutritional supplement program that can set you free. Authored by Charles Gant, MD, and Greg Lewis, PhD, a safe, effective, and natural way to stop the cravings and kick the habit. In my opinion, there is no better book, at least that I've ever read, for the biochemical aspect of addiction and recovery and how to optimize your biochemistry, specifically optimizing neurotransmitters like endorphin, enkephalin, serotonin, GABA, and catecholamines like dopamine and noradrenaline. This fantastic book came out in 2010. I read it while I was attending Mueller College, which is no longer open, but it was for many, many, many years back then, and that was a holistic school which was a trade school. There were different uh, courses you could take as a certification program to get a, you know, a trade, a, a skill. So when I was looking at a, applying there to that college, at first I was interested. I didn't even know they had a substance abuse counseling certification program. I was moving back from upstate New York back to my hometown of Ocean Beach in San Diego, California, and I wanted to stop cooking at restaurants. I had been a cook at restaurants, doing food service for so many years. I was so burned out. It was so low paying. And I really wanted to to develop a new skill that was not such demanding work. Uh, Additionally, in the restaurant industry, there's lots of people that abuse drugs and alcohol. So it was like, you know, kind of a, a situation I just really wanted to get out of. My dad at the time taught courses at Mueller College on things like herbalism, and nutrition. So I asked him to pick me up one of their uh, catalogs to see what kind of courses they had. I was interested in their massage therapy program initially. And then when I got the course catalog, it showed all their certification programs, including the the syllabuses for them and uh, the courses and what I'd be learning and what the prerequisites were, were. So as I'm thumbing through this, there's the massage therapy program. There was also a Holistic Health Practitioner, HHP, program. There was also two brand new programs. Those were kind of the OG programs that they had from the beginning of developing Mueller College. That was here in San Diego, California, uh, over by the Fashion Valley Mall, (laughs) which later on I worked like maybe not even a quarter mile away from there at an outpatient treatment program uh, after the college. But anyways, where was I going with that? Oh, yeah, they had two brand new programs. One of them was a personal trainer certification program, which I find kind of interesting because uh, my co-host of this podcast, Chris Scott, and I have a lot of similarities in our stories of recovery and also not so much our addictions, but somewhat some similarities in our addiction. Um, Our addictions were actually a lot different. There was more differences than similarities, but our recoveries were almost paralleled almost to the T. They were, you know, quite the same in almost every aspect. But Chris, after he, you know, got off alcohol, went to inpatient rehab, he quit his job, his career, his profession, working in finance. And he became a, per- he got certified to become a personal trainer. So I almost did that one. I, I was going through the same thing, right? I'm Here I am wanting to get off drugs and alcohol and wanting to help people do the same and wanting to find a new profession and everything. And so I almost picked massage therapist. Then I realized, I don't think I want to be doing that. That sounds like, you know, a lot of hard work on the hands. And that felt like it would just uh, be counterproductive for me. Also liking to play guitar, also liking to surf. So I wanted something more of like, you know, kind of a, a white collar job versus manual labor. So I opted out of massage therapy and the HHP, and also personal trainer because, lo and behold, they had a brand new program that had only been out for, I believe, maybe three months. 
it was really new. Uh, it was definitely newer than six months, but I believe it was only three months. Anyways, this was Alcohol and Drug Substance Abuse Counselor Program, AOD, Alcohol and Drug Counseling Certification Program. And it was a certification program that would get me certified in something called KDAC certification, which at the time was the gold standard to have as a substance abuse counselor. It means that almost any, anywhere would hire you because it was the, at least at the time, thought to be, believed to be, kind of the general consensus was, KDAC certification was the gold standard. As I started to read through the course syllabus, I was like, oh my God, this is like, it was like drug pharmacology and physiology and uh, drugs of abuse and addiction. I'm like, this is the story of my life. This, I mean, it was, it almost seemed like I'd barely have to do any studying uh, because I had just known, knew so much about drugs and alcohol and their effects. And uh, personally, because I had tried so many drugs and I had drank so much alcohol and I had really been interested in their pharmacology and, and physiology. And within maybe five to six months or less of attending that certification program, where, which was the first step to me getting into the field of substance abuse counseling, I came across this book online. It said, End Your Addiction Now, the proven nutritional supplement program that can set you free. Like I said, by far my absolute favorite book on the biochemical aspect of both risk factors for substance uh, issues and also relapse factors for substance issues, and also how to optimize micronutrients and macronutrients to repair the brain and the neurotransmitters and get it functioning so good that you actually feel good and balanced and don't have cravings and don't feel the need to use substances because the nutrients that you're bringing in are giving you the nutrients you need to create plentiful serotonin, endorphin, GABA, and catecholamines. And the only reason people uh, use alcohol or drugs in the first place is not because they want to actually drink or use the drug. It's because they want the feeling that the drink or drug gives them. The reason that the drink or drug gives them certain feelings is because all these substances do is they mimic the neurotransmitters that we already create naturally in our brains. They bind to specific receptor sites in our central nervous system and get across the blood-brain barrier, and that's why they work. So if drugs and alcohol did not bind to receptor sites and thus mimic certain neurotransmitters, we would not feel any type of effects from those. So before I get too carried away with this introduction, as I often do, <laughs> let's read real quick. Just a quick skim of the table of contents, just of part one, where I'm going to read the end of part one, and then we'll move right along to it. So contents, introduction one. So part one of the book, inter introducing the power recovery program. One, a revolution in the treatment of substance use problems. Two, how has substance use been treated historically? Three, our billion year old biochemistry. And four, why do some people develop substance problems? That is the section we're going to go to, specifically under a heading titled Risk Factors for Substance Use Problems. Uh, I was thumbing through, trying to find a good place to read. I mean, every single page of this book is amazing. I've read this book, I don't know, at least six or seven times. It's something, I think I read it three times in the first year after I got it, and, I, and I've come back to it so many times. Between this book and the book by Julia Ross, The Mood Cure, uh, for the first several years of addiction recovery and, and helping other people with substance use issues, those two books were like, oh, just so amazing. And if you've been following this podcast for a while, you'll know how Chris and I are so passionate about biochemical optimization and restoration for relapse prevention, for overcoming addiction and for just general health and wellness and just feeling good, you know, going through life, trying to, you know, feel good. It's not always possible. The cycles of rhythm show that we can't always feel good, but we can, there's a lot we can do to reduce, to first of all, overcome addiction. And second of all, optimize our mood and our energy and our mindset and our emotions. And third of all, 
to prevent relapse, to prevent cravings and all that. All right, so I've just gone on too long. Here we go. Quote, again, the title of this section is Risk Factors for Substance Use Problems. Thanks for bearing with me through the intro. Quote, I've talked at some length about the fact that compulsive substance use almost always results from biochemical imbalances, which disrupt the normal working of the cells of our brains. I've expanded this idea by giving you an overview of how our bodies function at the cellular and molecular, <laughs> molecular levels. Now I'd like to take a look at the four primary causes of the biochemical imbalances, which are at the root of substance cravings and problem substance use, poor nutrition, exposure to toxins, stress, and genetic vulnerabilities. Another way to think of these four causes is as risk factors for substance cravings, because the more prevalent they are in your life, the greater your risk of developing a substance problem. These risk factors and the symptoms they cause can continue for years after you've stopped abusing drugs and alcohol. It's important to note that the first three risk factors on my list, poor nutrition, toxin exposure, and stress, are present to some degree in almost everyone's life at times. In addition, each one of them is capable of itself of causing or contributing significantly to a wide variety of symptoms, some as obvious as heart arrhythmias, others as obscure and complex as depression, and where all three are present, they are often so intertwined with each other that it can be difficult to figure out which symptoms are caused by which risk factor. Each of these risk factors can have a profoundly negative impact on your biochemical balance. In addition, they are the principal risk factors not only for drug and alcohol cravings, but for many other chronic degenerative conditions that are virtually endemic to modern society. And yet, they are almost completely ignored in most of the recovery programs of which I'm aware. The Power Recovery Program highlights the importance of these risk factors and provides substance users with the means to reduce or eliminate them. Let me take some time to discuss each of them individually. End quote. So before we move on and I start reading more in depth about these four causes or these four top risk factors, let's start to deduce right here. So drugs and alcohol, all they do is mimic neurotransmitters that we already create. Endorphin, enkephalin, GABA, serotonin, and catecholamines like dopamine and noradrenaline, aka norepinephrine. Using these substances for a prolonged period of time makes our brains start to rely upon the substance to create these neurotransmitters. Essentially, it short circuits. And now when we stop using the substance, now we start craving for that substance. Why? Because we have low neurotransmitters, specifically the neurotransmitters that the drug mimics and then also depleted. So it hijacks our brain. What leads to these biochemical imbalances in the first place, which leads people to actually really enjoy the effects of the alcohol and the drug so much that they become compulsive and even get into addiction, is according to Dr. Charles Gant, when we have low specific neurotransmitters, that's why people have different drugs of choice. Some people's drug of choice might be alcohol. For others, it might be opioids. For others, it might be stimulants. According to Dr. Charles Gant, Julia Ross, and so many other pioneers in this field, one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, is due to our biochemical imbalances, specifically our neurotransmitter deficits. And so what leads to these biochemical imbalances in the first place before we even start using drugs and alcohol? Like he said, poor nutrition, stress, genetic vulnerabilities, and toxins. All right, back to the book. Quote, here's the section on poor nutrition. Quote, one of the keys to an understanding of the impact of nutrition on general health and on symptoms such as substance cravings can be found in the blood. Our blood is almost literally a nutrient soup. After the food we eat is digested and absorbed, nutrient molecules are carried in the bloodstream to the cells where they're taken in through surface receptors and in other ways for use by the cells. Nutrient molecules which don't get into the bloodstream cannot be made available for use by the cells of the body. There are a number of reasons why this might happen, among the most important of which are that the nutrients are not in our food in the first place. We choose a diet of nutritionally deficient foods and our bodies have difficulty absorbing the nutrients in the foods we consume. In order to understand why, 
we need to look at the quality of the food we eat and at our dietary habits. Unfortunately, the picture is pretty grim in many ways. The deteriorating quality of our food supply. For the past 50 years especially, the quality and nutritional value of the food most people consume has deteriorated drastically. For starters, the tremendous increase in the use of pesticides and herbicides in modern agriculture has resulted in the contamination of much of our food supply with powerful toxins which, because they become a part of the food we eat, our bodies must process and eliminate. In addition, the soil in which plants are grown is no less a living thing than the plants themselves, and the use of pesticides and chemical fertilizers has contributed to the gradual deterioration of soil quality. The soil is being depleted of minerals and other nutrients that would otherwise be absorbed by growing plants and become part of the food supply. This has resulted in food with much less nutritional value than the food consumed by our ancestors only a hundred years ago. Add to this the fact that a large percentage of the food we eat has been highly processed and refined, with much of the remaining nutrient content thus removed, and you can begin to get an idea of one of the primary causes of the decline in nutrition that is epidemic today. The nutritional value of the food we eat has been significantly reduced in the past 50 years. Many nutrients essential to healthy cell function, which were part of our ancestors' diets, are either missing entirely or in short supply in much of the food we eat. Obviously, if the nutrients are in short supply in the food we eat, they'll also be undersupplied to the cells of our bodies, increasing the chances of biochemical imbalances. Poor food choices. A further cause of poor nutrition can be found in our eating habits, and no better example exists than today's high-carbohydrate diet fad. Side note, remember, this was uh, came out in 2010. Somehow the absolutely false notion that high-carbohydrate diets are beneficial to humans has gained currency. Nothing could be further from the truth, because the carbohydrates consumed in diets of this kind are often highly refined, and because so much high-carbohydrate food is relatively low in amino acids, this ill-advised diet alone can be responsible for biochemical imbalances, which cause substance cravings in otherwise healthy people. I'm going to give you a specific example. Chemically speaking, the term carbohydrate is just a fancy name for sugar. Carbohydrate molecules are either simple sugars like fructose or are made up of two or more sugar molecules linked together into complex carbohydrate chains. By the time you've chewed that forkful of pasta or baked potato to the point at which you can swallow it, salivary enzymes have begun to break down many of those carbohydrate molecules into their component parts and you're essentially gulping down a mouthful of sugar. As several experts have pointed out, eating a medium-sized baked potato is the equivalent of eating about a half of a cup of refined sugar. Now, sugars are food for yeast. Yeast thrive and multiply on a diet of sugar, and what people call a high-carbohydrate diet is really a high-sugar diet because it provides the harmful yeast in our intestines with exactly the kind of nutrients they need. This high-sugar diet can help yeast to compete more successfully against beneficial organisms in the large intestine. When yeast digest sugar, they produce alcohol, and alcohol kills many forms of bacteria. The alcohol produced by sugar-fed yeast in our large intestines kills off many strains of bacteria, including bifidus and lactobacillus acidophilus, which are beneficial to humans. Alcohol is, in fact, just one of the many toxins produced by yeast in order to compete with other intestinal flora. Maldigestion and malabsorption. There are other conditions besides nutrient-poor food and poor eating habits that can result in lower availability of nutrients in our blood. Primary among these are maldigestion and malabsorption. Even if our diet consists of toxin-free foods of the highest nutritional value, we won't get the full benefit unless those nutrients are broken down properly and absorbed into the bloodstream and become available for use by our body's cells in carrying out life functions. Unfortunately, that's not always a given. Digestion of food is performed by digestive enzymes secreted in the mouth, stomach, and small intestines. The enzymes at work in the small intestines are produced by specialized organs such as the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Beneficial intestinal flora also assist in the process of digestion. Food is broken down through the process of digestion into its basic building blocks, simple fats, amino acids, proteins, and sugars, so that these substances can be reconstituted into essential molecules and body components. 
from enzymes to muscle tissue. Among the factors that can interfere with digestion are toxins, nutritional deficiencies, and the overgrowth of harmful microorganisms such as yeast in the intestines. Digestive enzymes, which are made from amino acids derived largely from protein, play such a critical role in promoting good health that I prescribe them as supplements for almost every patient that consults with me. There are a number of possible causes of malabsorption or a reduction of the ability to absorb nutrients after they have been digested. As part of the process of colonization, intestinal flora use glue-like substances to fasten themselves onto the walls of the large intestine. Where imbalances resulting in an overgrowth of harmful bacteria occur, they may literally outgrow their environment and force their way backwards from the large intestine to the small intestine. When they attach themselves to the walls of the small intestine, they can block off areas through which nutrients are absorbed. In addition, toxins from harmful bacteria can damage the cells of the intestinal lining, further preventing absorption. In some cases, this can result in the reduction of the area of absorption from its normal two tennis court size to the size of a small closet. And since about 90% of nutrition and since about 90% of nutrient absorption takes place through the walls of the small intestine, anything that limits that absorption can have serious consequences for our ability to provide nutrients to the cells of our bodies. Malabsorption of nutrients can also result from problems in digesting food completely. A variety of enzymes produced by specialized cells and secreted primarily into the small intestine complete the digestion of proteins. Digestive problems such as the inability of the pancreas to produce sufficient quantities of certain digestive enzymes can result in incomplete protein digestion. Undigested protein putrefies in the large intestine, becoming yet another source of intestinal toxin. In addition, undigested protein may pass out of the body in the stool, leaving smaller quantities of protein available to be absorbed and used by the body. The end result of the consumption of poor quality, highly processed food, along with maldigestion and malabsorption, causes malnutrition. Malnutrition, in turn, causes starvation, a condition from which a significant majority of people in the United States and other Western democracies suffer. And malnutrition can result in the brains not being able to produce the neurotransmitters that keep us focused, calm, and happy. The key reason most people turn to addictive substances. Toxins. I've mentioned several of the toxins, including pesticides, preservatives, and chemical additives that contaminate much of the food we eat, as well as toxins produced by harmful microorganisms in our digestive systems and other systems that can contribute to nutritional imbalances. Among the other toxins that most of us deal with, at least occasionally, and often on a daily basis, are prescription antibiotics and heavy metals. Antibiotic drugs, the word antibiotic means against life, are powerful poisons. They're designed to kill bacteria and cause infectious diseases. And I'm the first to agree that antibiotics have dramatically improved the quality of our lives and lessened our risk of dying from infectious diseases. But antibiotics don't just kill harmful bacteria. Many of them also kill beneficial bacteria that inhabit the intestine. This, in turn, makes them unavailable to compete with harmful microorganisms, causing or exacerbating imbalances among intestinal flora. These imbalances are made even worse by the fact that most commonly prescribed antibiotics do not kill yeast. If, for instance, you take an antibiotic drug for 10 days to get over a throat infection, you will also have killed large numbers of intestinal bacteria, seriously altering the balance of microorganisms in your large intestine, often in favor of yeast. And if you've had frequent antibiotic treatments, as many young children do today, or if you eat the meat of animals given high doses of antibiotics along with their feed, you may be at risk for chronic intestinal imbalances. A high percentage of the grain and vegetable crops grown today is treated with extremely toxic pesticides and herbicides. When we eat such food, or when we eat meat from animals fed with pesticide-treated grains, our bodies must get rid of the toxins thus absorbed. When the toxic load is greater than our bodies can deal with, toxic substances can remain in the small intestine, actually damaging the intestinal walls, where most of the nutrients we consume are absorbed. Among the other toxins which can contribute to biochemical imbalances 
and which are present in a high percentage of my substance abuse patients are heavy metals. Mercury, lead, aluminum, and cadmium contamination can come from many sources, including dental fillings, cookware, the water supply, and some of the foods we eat, especially deep sea fish such as tuna and swordfish. These substances often compromise cell functions in significant ways. The healthcare system today generally ignores the threats to health imposed by toxins, electing instead to worsen the toxicity problem by overprescribing drugs, which themselves are toxins, to cover up the symptoms caused by toxins in the first place. Exclamation mark. Stress. In the previous chapter, I discussed how the overrelease and depletion of several specific neurotransmitters can be triggered by physical and or emotional stress. I'd like to expand on that by giving you an overview of how both acute and prolonged stress can cause or contribute to nutritional shortages and toxin overload. Among the first things our bodies do when we're confronted with a stressful situation, whether it's a relatively non-threatening, as a chance meeting with someone we dislike, or as a dangerous as nearly losing control of the automobile we're driving, is to begin the over-release of stress hormones. Our body's capabilities for responding to stress by releasing greater amounts of neurotransmitters and stress hormones greatly improve our chances of survival in true life or death situations. However, our responses to the relatively benign stress that the majority of us deal with in our daily lives are not always tempered according to the seriousness of the situation. In response to even relatively low levels of stress, the signals sent by stress hormones cause our bodies to divert large amounts of oxygen and glucose to the brain, muscles, and heart, which need to be mobilized in stressful situations. Digestion, urination, and reproductive activities can come to a virtual standstill during times of stress. In cases of chronic or long-term stress, whether it's in response to an illness or an emotionally or physically taxing event, the body continues to, to use larger than normal quantities of many proteins and blood pressure remains high as we continue to deal with the source of stress. High stress hormone and neurotransmitter requirements can quickly tax our body's supplies of the nutrients needed for their production. In extreme cases, and when stressful situations go on for long periods of time, our bodies divert nutrients needed in other parts of the body to the brain. During extended periods of stress, unless nutrient supplies are replenished and kept at high levels, chronic shortages can develop, leading to the inability of our brains to produce these neurotransmitters at the high levels required to enable us to continue coping. And because of the depletion of stress hormones, which also enable us to fully appreciate the pleasurable experiences of life, our capacity to experience the joy and pleasure that facilitates emotional bonding with others is also diminished. Among the frequent results of unresolved long-term stress is what has come to be known as burnout. People suffering from burnout, which is another way of saying exhaustion, are often chronically irritable, angry, listless, depressed, and lacking in motivation. But in fact, burnout is a chronic depletion of stress hormones and neurotransmitters Due to a combination of nutritional deficiencies, toxin exposure, especially through the use of psychotropic toxins, and stress. I've painted a pretty dark picture of people who are poisoned, starved, and stressed. The good news is that the Power Recovery Program will show you how to correct these conditions, whether you have a substance problem or not. But, while we can usually make changes to improve our diets and eating habits, lessen our exposure to toxins, and reduce the level of stress in our lives, when it comes to the vulnerability substance abusers have to psychoactive chemicals, there is one risk factor that we are unable to change. That component, of course, is the genetic component. Genetic vulnerabilities. It will likely be many years before we can do anything to directly modify any genes we may have inherited which make us vulnerable to the effects of alcohol and or drugs. You've got to be you, and there are no two ways about it. The genetic code, which plays a significant part in determining who we are, biochemically speaking, is stored in the DNA in virtually every one of our body cells. And among the functions DNA codes for are the several components of our responses to deficiencies in neurotransmitters caused by stress, toxicity, and nutritional deficiencies, as well as to the use of psychotropic substances. While we can't change our genes, 
we can certainly understand the role they play in making us susceptible to substance abuse. What's even more important is that, contrary to what you may have heard, there's actually a great deal we can do to overcome the possible consequences of any such genetic tendencies we may have. The situation is far from hopeless. In fact, as you read this section, you'll discover that even if you're highly genetically vulnerable, there is no reason you have to give in to compulsive substance use. And if you're already a substance user and have in inherited vulnerabilities, I'll show you what you need to do to counteract your genetic tendencies and significantly reduce or eliminate your tendency to, to develop cravings for alcohol or drugs. A majority of the studies which attempt to isolate genetic vulnerabilities have focused on alcohol. But even without scientific studies, most of us could identify friends or acquaintances who are genetically susceptible to alcohol abuse. Genetic vulnerability often surfaces as early as our teenage years, and it usually takes the form of someone who's capable of drinking heavily for long periods of time, often days, often with very little or no sleep. The person genetically susceptible to alcohol can often consume quantities of beer, wine, or liquor so great that they would make most people become violently ill if they hadn't already passed out. Those genetically susceptible to alcoholism also often react differently from the rest of us the morning after and evening of excessive drinking. Whereas most people spend the next day nursing deadly hangovers, vowing never to take another drink, those genetically vulnerable to alcoholism often find that starting to drink again is their key to feeling better. When I speak of the genetic basis for alcoholism, and for other substances as well, I mean that there is a genetic vulnerability to nutrient deficiencies resulting from alcohol use and or exposure to psychotropic toxins, in this case to alcohol. In animals, many genes associated with vulnerability to alcohol have been discovered and it is likely that dozens more will ultimately be identified in humans as well. The more genes we inherit for those vulnerabilities, the more severe and rapid the progress any alcohol or drug problem will develop is likely to be. Vulnerability to alcoholism has a genetic component, but that component simply, translate, but that component simply translates into higher requirements for certain nutrients, such as amino acids and minerals, that support human life. In terms of brain chemistry, people genetically vulnerable to alcoholism process alcohol somewhat differently than those not as vulnerable. In some cases, this means that the alcoholic person produces higher levels of a toxic byproduct of alcohol called THQ, which works in the same way as enkephalins, the natural painkillers our brains produce. Other evidence suggests that Alcohol artificially stimulates gamma-aminobutyric acid, GABA. This artificial stimulation can result in an increase in the production of dopamine, the major feel-good neurotransmitter our brains produce. Research has also shown that in genetically vulnerable people, alcohol can affect cell membrane flexibility and can influence brain cells' ability to manufacture and utilize the hundreds of enzymes that do the housekeeping of metabolism. These enzymes seem to adapt to the presence of alcohol and begin to function normally only when alcohol is present. We have covered the four general areas that are considered risk factors for substance problems. You might be confident in your capability to change your circumstances when it comes to poor nutrition, toxins, and stress, but not so confident if you know or find out that you have a genetic vulnerability, as described in the section above. The important thing I want you to understand is that while we can't change our genetic makeup, we can work successfully through managing other aspects of our lives to minimize the potentially negative impact of many genetic conditions. When we work to reduce stress and the intake of toxins, and when we control our diets, we can go a long way toward overcoming genetic vulnerabilities. All right, so to sum things up, uh, this book is fantastic. Highly recommend if you haven't checked it out already. Within this book, not only is his power recovery program all laid out step by step, but he even has uh, different assessments in there that come with the book where you can answer these subjective questions. There's different sections to find out whether you're likely or very likely deficient in endorphin and kephalin neurotransmitter category, GABA category, catecholamines category, which is dopamine and norepinephrine and epinephrine, and also serotonin category. He's got different sections for quitting alcohol, 
for quitting painkillers, for quitting benzos, for quitting cannabis, for quitting cigarettes and nicotine, as these different substances bind to different neurotransmitter sites and thus have differences in how they spike our neurotransmitter production. He's got details, step by step again, on which amino acids and other supplements to take for things like neurotransmitter production, better nutrient absorption, better toxin elimination, etc. What Dr. Gant and Dr. Greg Lewis do in this book is they make very complex biochemical and biological and physiological DNA, all that type of stuff, concepts much simpler to understand. I mean, it's just so, it's just so well written. I read it in like one or two sittings. The first time I ever read it, probably two sittings. It is under 300 pages long. And I found that it's a real, you know, smooth read. It's just the organization and the in-depth, step-by-step, very actionable tactics and strategies is quite phenomenal. And I also wanted to add just a quick little thought or two on the genetic vulnerability section. This was written again in 2010. So since then, there has been a lot of research into a field called epigenetics. That's uh, in biology. Epigenetics is the study of like heritable phenotype changes, which don't involve alterations in the DNA sequence. What epigenetics refers to uh, is an implication of features that are on top of or in addition to the traditional genetic basis for inheritance. It's involved with changes that affect gene activity and expression. So you can actually upregulate or downregulate or turn on or turn off specific genes, including genetic vulnerability genes. There's also a new field uh, called nutrigenomics. Nutrigenomics goes along with epigenetics. That is life's customized lifestyle strategies based on your needs and biochemistry and preferences and goals to upregulate certain genes and downregulate certain genes. Nutrigenomics is the use of customized supplements, diet, nutrition, fitness, and other strategies to more optimize which genetics you are actually playing out that are turned on and which ones are turned off. A lot of the podcast episodes we've done, we don't use the words epigenetics or nutrigenomics, although I know I have in the past, but all the things we're talking about with supplements and movement slash exercise, sunshine, therapy, cold showers, Epsom salt baths, all that, those can all be used to optimize nutrigenomics and epigenetics and thus make you much, much, much less prone to having cravings, addictions, relapse, etc. I could have put together a little uh, keynote presentation and done a training on this myself, but I really wanted you to learn from Dr. Charles Gant, MD, and Greg Lewis, PhD, because they can teach it about a million times better than I can, being that they have such extensive background in these topics. And with that being said, as always, thank you so much for listening, and I can't wait for you to join me on the next episode. Take care.